Welcome to the Sustainable Clinical Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Sarah Smith. I am a practicing rural family physician and the charting coach. This is the podcast for physicians and advanced practice providers who are ready to step back from the busyness of their clinical day to share ideas, question everything, and redesign their clinical day. We are redesigning clinical medicine to create sustainable clinical days and create time for our lives outside of medicine. Join us for discussions with world experts who are helping design sustainable models of clinical medicine and the physicians or clinicians who have discovered or designed sustainable models of clinical medicine for themselves. Good morning, everybody. Wherever I find you, I am hoping you are having a wonderful week. Today, we are going to be chatting to Dr. Christy Bartlett, uh, who I am going to get to introduce herself so we can learn all about you and your journey. Yeah. Hey, so my name is Christy Bartlett. I am a palliative medicine physician um, in Kansas City. I do primarily inpatient consults. I'm also the medical director of our inpatient hospice program. I um, am a mother of three busy kiddos. Um, so that's me. Perfect. So let's hear a bit about um, medicine for you. Um, things that were a struggle or difficult for you, things that you, if you were to have a before story, um, let's hear about that. What was going on for you about medicine that wasn't so fun? Yeah. You know, I don't know that I ever really identified struggling a lot. I kind of just thought that being busy and writing notes after work was kind of normal. So my normal day would be, you know, rounding on patients and then trying to get as much work done as I could at work, but then also wanting to be home in time to, you know, have dinner with the kids and go to their activities. And so I would often be charting, you know, put the kids to bed, chart from nine to 11 or so. And so I kind of just thought that was normal. <laughs> and I don't know if I was ever totally bothered by it. Um, until uh, I ran across you at um, the Women Physician Wellness Conference. And it kind of like jostled something in my brain to think like, oh, it doesn't have to be like this. Yeah. Now, when we say women, um, the WPW conference, like this was me talking to a room full of people for what, an hour, maybe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So before this, before this talk, you're like, life is normal. I'm doing what mm -hmm. everybody else is doing. I get home. I enjoy my kids for a few hours and then I'm back on the computer nine to 11. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. How long had you been doing that for? Nine years. Nine years. Nine years. Completely normal. Had you ever asked anyone about it? You know, we all talked about it um, and we kind of call it the pajama time. And we'd all kind of lament, I, I guess, you know, and it was that struggle between do I stay at work a little bit late and get everything done or do I go home so I can have time with my kids and then be charting late into the evening. So I think we all just kind of thought it was normal. We identified it as, you know, suboptimal for sure, but um, we kind of just accepted it as part of the job. Mm hmm. Okay. So then you come to a conference in the middle of beautiful Grand Cayman. Yes. It was very beautiful. The water there is deliciously clear uh, with beautiful sea life. And, um, and then you hear this talk that says, it doesn't have to be this way. But tell mm -hmm. me, what happened in that hour for you? Yeah. I think it just struck me that there were very simple. I mean, the things that you talk about are fairly simple and common sense. And I don't know if it just like, oh my gosh, like these are things that I could actually do. And I, it doesn't have to be the norm to be charting late at night. And a question was asked. I don't know if you asked it, but it was, what would you do if you had time? Was it you that asked that? Yeah. It was and one I was of my just, favorite questions to ask. So yeah. I could have been me. <laughs> and I was like, huh, I would, I would take a bath, <laughs> which seems <laughs> ridiculous, but I love a good bubble bath. And I just haven't had time for mm. a very long time to take a bath. And so, um, 
I was like, I would take a bath. And actually like two weeks after we got back from Grand Cayman, I had the t- time and I was like, what do I do with myself? And I, I took a bath and I was like, Ooh, this is like, this is it. Yeah. Okay. So two weeks came home from Grand Cayman. Two weeks later, you're sitting on the couch thinking, what do I do with all this time? Uh-huh. Now yeah. everybody is thinking you're a unicorn mm-hmm. <laughs> or there's something wrong with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tell us what happened. What did you take away from that and start to implement? How did life look? Or what was your clinical day looking like before and after? Give us Mm -hmm. that kind of changes that you put into place. Yeah. So beforehand, what would happen is I would huddle with my team. So we have a a very large palliative care team. There are six different rounding teams. So my team, it's myself, a nurse and a social worker, and then learners oftentimes. And we would huddle around oh, 9.15, kind of get a game plan for the day. And then we'd start seeing patients and we'd see a patient and we'd step out and we'd kind of debrief and talk about it. And then we'd move on and we'd see another patient. We'd kind of debrief and the entire day would go like this. And on a good day, I'd be done by seeing patients by about four. And then I'd sit down in my office and I'd try to write notes and I would just be physically and mentally and emotionally kind of spent. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I would get distracted by the coffee in my office and the snacks in my office. And so try as I may to get my notes done in a decent amount of time, it just typically didn't happen. So um, when I listened to your talk, the things that I took away, the big one was like charting immediately after you see a patient or during a patient encounter. And I was like, in my mind, it felt like that was going to be counterproductive and it was going to take a lot longer. Um, but I started doing that. And so I also started opening all of my charts, you know, as a consult team, we don't have to see every single patient, but you typically get a sense in the morning when you're chart checking, like who needs a visit. And so I would open their charts and I would just get my note teed up Mm because there's a lot you can glean from overnight nursing notes and, you know, checking labs and vitals, et cetera. So I'd just get my note teed up with um, the basics for that day. And then we'd go see a patient. And then immediately my team knew, I was like, we're going to take five minutes. Mm -hmm. The nurse is going to check in with the bedside nurse or physical therapy and kind of, you know, make sure we're all on the same page. Our social worker is going to work on, you know, some discharge planning, et cetera. Like every, everyone has something to do Mm -hmm. that can be very productive and efficient. So I would just sit down and I'd knock my note out. It was fresh in my mind. It didn't take very long. Um, And then that way, everything's wrapped up. The orders are in, the notes in, all the other consulting teams and the primary team, they know what my plan is. Mm -hmm. Um, And opening a note, I found at the beginning of the day, people know who from our team, because we have a ginormous team, they -hmm. know who from our team is going to be seeing that patient. So for so many different reasons, it made sense. It was efficient. It was better for patient care. Um, And so that's what I started doing. And at the beginning of the day, it feels maybe just a little bit tedious to do that. And you feel like, okay, we should keep moving. But if, if I stick with that plan, we are incredibly efficient. We're, you know, and I'm like, I can be done with seeing patients and writing notes by four o'clock in the afternoon. And then I'm on my way home and it's amazing. It's delightful. And I, I have time. If I have a really sick patient that needs more attention, I've got time to circle back. Mm -hmm. and check in. So again, like really good for patient care, good for me, good for our team. It's been life-changing. Good. Oh, I love this. So exciting. Um, What resistance did you come across to this? Um, Internal and external? Yeah, I think internal, just convincing myself that it would work and sticking with it. You know, when you're like, writing a note outside of a patient room and you're like, oh, I've got like, you know, eight more patients to see and I'm writing a note. But if you do it and you stick with it, it, it works. And I actually, I gave a presentation to my team because my team was like, what are you doing? That's like, <laughs> yeah, you're going home. When yeah. you're thing. <laughs> What's going on with you? Um, so I actually gave them a presentation about your presentation and the things that I learned from it. And um, I made this graph of, you know, time during the day and work that you still need to do after you're done. So if you are able to like see a patient, come out of the room, write your note, like this is your amount of work, 
you write your note, the work goes down. Like mm-hmm. you do that again, you see a patient, you write your note, your work goes down. Whereas if you're seeing 12 patients a day and you're not yeah. charting on them, you, yeah. the amount of work you have at the end of the day is this, the when your brain it. is fried, you have no energy. And then you're trying to knock out all those notes. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, that I, I think they identified with that. So amazing. We've had um, other teams and departments come in as a collective to do this work and create some communication around looking after each other, not just ourselves, like as colleagues, we know that if you're, you know, Dr. Bartlett's going home and now she's going to work for another two hours and she's going to delay bedtime and then she's going to get up tired and she's going to come back and do the same again tomorrow she probably won't stay as long as Dr. Butler who leaves at four and goes and figures out how to have a bubble bath again. Yeah. Um, Amazing work. And I love that you kind of included the team and they noticed they're like, something's different about you. We want want to know what that is. Yeah. And it it took a little bit of buy-in from the rest of my my team that I work with and we rotate between different social workers and and nurses on our team. So it it took a little bit of buy-in, but then after doing this workflow for a while, they were like, no, this works for all of us because they had things that they needed to accomplish in that time that I was charting. And so they're like, we love this. And again, our team is done um, at a very decent time in the afternoon. And so it, it works not just for me, but my entire team. Yeah. Do you come in before that first round starts at 9.15 to look through the the charts or do you do that within that meeting? Mm, I I usually try to get to work around 8 or 8.15 and I'll start doing my my chart review. And that's the time that I open up my notes and get Mm -hmm. everything teed up. And then when I meet with my full team around 9, 9 9.15, that's a very quick you know, ideally 10, 15 minute run through of the patients, what we need to do for that particular patient that day, um, and kind of get a game plan for where we start. Um, and geographically we have like three different, um, towers in mm-hmm. our hospital. So it, it takes a lot of planning on like where to, where to be at what time, but. Got it. With your, um, students, residents, uh, medical students, other people, learners within your environment, um, what was their role before with regards to documentation? Mm-hmm. So fourth year medical students, um, residence fellows will do charting. Um, I haven't had a ton of time to work with residents since I've implemented this. I've had mm-hmm. a little bit of time, um, but this is definitely something that I am going to emphasize with our learners because I think it's so important for them as they figure out how to be a physician that they also figure out how to um, be a physician and have a life and not, you know, get bogged down in work. And so if that's something that I can teach them in addition to palliative care, I will feel like very accomplished in that way. So I have emphasized with the learners that I've worked with, like, listen, we're going to be efficient. I want you to see your patient. I want you to pen a note. We're going to talk about it. And then you're going to knock it out when I go see another patient. So Mm -hmm. that's something that we've been emphasizing. And I plan to emphasize ongoing. Nice. Okay, good. What about teaching? When were you fitting in that teaching aspect of your role? Is that Mm -hmm. in a different part to the clinical hours or within the clinical day? A little bit of both. So if we have a learner on our team, um, I do a lot of bedside teaching Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll step out of the room and kind of follow up on, you know, what we see, what the learner is kind of thinking in terms of like, what are the symptoms? What's the best intervention for the symptoms? Like globally, what, what makes sense in terms of a plan of care? Um, and so we talk about that a lot, like as we're rounding, I Mm -hmm. also do some teaching. We have case-based collaborative learning with first and second year med students, which is just kind of a, a round table discussion about different cases. And then, um, some different kind of debriefing sessions with third year med students. So I get a lot of like touches with the, with the Mm -hmm. learners here and there. So when you pop this into practice, the teaching component doesn't go away. So what is the workflow there? So you've got a teaching event happening in the room. You Mm -hmm. step out of the room. Do you teach first, then notes? Do you notes first, then teach? What is the kind of flow right now? Um, You know, it's variable. I think kind of however, whatever feels 
right. I mean, if there's something fresh on my mind when we walk out of the room, then I'm going to want to kind of talk through it. Mm -hmm. There are other times too, that I'm like, listen, I'm going to sit down, give me five minutes, think of the question from that patient encounter. And then as we are walking across the hospital on our five minute walk to our next patient, like, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. I love that. So the thing um, about teaching, as we grow into our teaching methodologies, one of the the possibilities is not the giving of information. It's the also fact finding or information gathering that they, that skill that they need to develop the on the fly. How do I find the answer to this problem? Mm -hmm. And so you've given yourself and your learner the space to do that. You're like, okay, that was interesting. What do you think would be the next best step if they're at that point, right? At the management level, you've got five minutes and a phone off you go. Right. Well, I get this done. You're going to go figure out what, what can you find out right now? What's already in your head and what can you go and verify against the the things? And then tell me your references. Exactly. These pieces are helpful for your learner because now you're going to be able to judge their skill at finding the information, marking it against what the patient's experience is. So putting it into that social context and not what is the you know most evidence base for this patient and makes the most sense in this context. Right. They're exactly. really great skills for us to be able to observe in our learners. Yes. And doesn't require us to know all the answers. Exactly. <laughs> They're more likely to know then what to do next time they come across one of these because they've done the work to find the answer. And then you can, like you said, we'll discuss it on the walk. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. Did you have to do any actual physical changes to the way you were doing anything or the devices that you had to do the notes to make this process work for you? Not really. Um, I I guess just in terms of the location that I'm at in writing notes. So this is a little bit silly, but there's one of the units in our hospital that I hate the keyboards. Like they Mm -hmm. just, they're just like, meh. Um, And so I know that I know the units where the keyboards are, are better and more efficient to type on. So, and then it's just a matter of finding space, but we've got computers outside of pretty much every patient room in our hospital. And so doing notes in that environment is easier because if I go back to my office, as much as I appreciate having an office, I'm so distracted. Um, and you know, people know where to find me and they're popping in and out and like, Hey, what are your kids up to this week? You know, mm-hmm. like, um, things that I enjoy talking about, but like, we're, we're going to get work done. Like we're at work, we're going to work. Um, so just doing that on the unit, it's much more conducive to getting notes done and out of the way. Um, you'll otherwise I interrupted though on the unit, right. You'll still get the, um, you're seeing patient in this room and somebody w- wants to walk past you and talk about the next patient. What are your kind of mm-hmm. ideas on language for that? How have you tried to kind of reduce that for yourself? Yeah. There are some times that I'll go like to the opposite side of the unit where I know that there aren't as many people, or if I know maybe a family member of the patient I just saw might walk out, mm-hmm. um, and, think of another question. I might go to the other side of the unit just so I'm not as, um, they can't find me as easily. I think Mm -hmm. my team also does a good job too. My nurse fields a lot of clinical questions. And so if I'm there typing, like she's kind of running interference over here, um, to field questions and, um, Yeah. yeah, so that works pretty well. What did the conversation look like when you wanted to implement this? Um, well, I told, I told my team, I was like, I went to this conference and this Dr. Sarah Smith had all these brilliant ideas and I really want to try it. And so I just kind of gave them a rundown of what it was going to look like off the bat. And they were kind of like, okay, (laughs) they didn't give a a whole lot of pushback. Um, and so, yeah. And after a couple of days of doing it, um, they were like, oh yeah, this kind of works. So It was a pretty easy transition. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So there was the initial skepticism that this would be useful and helpful and be able to work. There was the being brave and talking out loud to your team about what you'd like to change and how it could even benefit them potentially if we can give this a go. And then there's the messy middle of the first few days. Um, Did it look like longer? Did it take longer in the first few days to get through the patient load? With your team. Um, you know, I, 
I don't think it did. I think it was pretty seamless. Like initially when we implemented it, like it, it it took a little bit of fine tuning in terms of like how I get my notes prepped to just like Mm -hmm. open them back up and, and take over and, and get them done. But it was pretty seamless and you feel at the first few days, you feel like you're taking longer just because Mm -hmm. instead of moving like boom, 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 patient to patient, you've got that little extra time built in to do your notes. So it felt subjectively just like it was taking a little bit longer, but then you're moving through the day and you're like, huh, we're, we've like seen most of our patients. My notes are done. And then it's, it's pretty apparent that it works really well. So love this. So helpful for others because you've gone not only and done it for yourself, but you've implemented it within a team and then you've gone even broader. What else have you done then in your evenings now? So you've upped the bubble baths. What else is different about your life now? Yeah. Um, I'm exercising um, pretty regularly. Yeah. And nothing like crazy intense by any means, Mm -hmm. but like pretty most days of the week I'm exercising, which is fantastic. Um, I'm reading books. Wow like normal people stuff that I haven't done for a really long time. It's been lovely. Um, and just my, my husband's a stay at home dad. And so he takes on like all of the work all of the time. Um, and so it's kind of been nice when I get home, I can jump in and like drive kids places and, you know, um, help with dinner and just be available in the evenings to do the things that I like to do. Wonderful. So excited for you. This sounds so different to it wasn't you weren't even having a bad time in medicine, but just that enlightenment that it could be even different if you want it to be. Yeah. And then just diving right in to the messy middle to create something different. Yeah. Um, okay. So if you those um out there, you've got other palliative care teams, you've got other doctors who are just doing normal two hours of charting every evening. What would you say to them? Yeah, I would say just try this workflow. Um, It feel, it might feel a little bit awkward, you know, on the front end, um, but just try it for a week and just see if it, you know, if it makes a difference, because I'm pretty sure it it will. Um, The results were pretty profound for myself. So I would say just between opening your charts in the morning, getting them teed up, sitting down, writing a note immediately after you see that patient. Um, it's, I mean, it, it, that's it, you know, it's not magic by any means. So I would say just like, just try that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Any parting words, anything else that you think people should know that you've learned along your journey, because like you weren't having a bad experience, but you will have had other colleagues doing life different to you. Anything else that you think we didn't talk about you'd like to say? Oh gosh. Um. I think just looking for those things during the day that, well, yeah, looking for the things during the day that might not bother you, but might be able to be different and better and don't settle for the status quo. You know, I think I just settled for a very long time and thought that was just how being a doctor is, you know, it's going to be hard and we're going to work late at night. It almost felt like this badge of honor to be like, yeah, I was charting at midnight and me. Um, but it's not, and you don't have to do that. So, um, yeah, take care of yourself, do things, you know, and we, I think we do think of wellness as like the bubble bath, which again, I do love a good bubble bath, but that's not wellness. Like giving yourself the ability to then choose what you want to do to relax. I feel like that is the root of wellness. And so if you can optimize your clinical schedule and your workflow to give yourself more freedom to do the things you want like that. I think is where wellness starts. Mm. Yeah. And then finally, when you decided to go to um, Women Physician Wellness Conference, what did that come out of? So what was the decision tree that helped you want to go to a conference? Because there's lots of things on offer. And I'm just curious where, if you're comfortable with that question, what that looked like. Absolutely. So Dr. Erica Howe, who... um, runs the women physician wellness conference is a very dear friend of mine. And so I've been on the bandwagon, like since she started this whole thing and I'm like, okay, if I can be a supportive friend and come to the, you know, Grand Cayman, I'll do it. (laughs) And it is such a fantastic, I'm just going to brag on her for a minute. It's such a fantastic conference. Um, 
and the things that I have learned and taken away that have benefited, obviously my wellness, my efficiency, my patient care, my, my billing. Um, there are so many just like downstream effects of focusing on our wellness, being among people who are like-minded and just feeling that support of other women physicians who identify with your struggles. Um, it, it, it is my favorite conference and I am working on having perfect attendance, at least, you know, to go to one, one of her conferences a year. Cause it's just fantastic. Yeah. And I, Sarah, thank you. I, I was like, I was telling Erica, I was like, Sarah Smith changed my life. I was like, this is revolutionary. Um, I was like, so thank you for hosting the conference. Thank you for having Sarah because like my life is so much better. So thank you for speaking there and having such brilliant ideas. Oh yeah. My pleasure. It is. I agree that, um, place where you can come that's outside of the normal clinical day. So you have that big step back and have a look at what's happening within your world and within the place where you've got other people who are going through the same walk with you, Mm -hmm. because you have that experience that medicine can be very lonely and you're just copying everybody else and what they're doing. And they're all leaving their charts to the end of the day and going home late or doing them later. And so we're just like you said, we're in that status quo. We're just doing what we thought was normal and didn't kind of do that big step back and say, but wait, I'm kind of missing out on exercise and bubble baths and helping out around the home, which could be yeah. fun too. <laughs> yes. Love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on and giving us your story. And this, I, I wanted to capture your story because I'm like literally one hour and your whole life is different. I'm like, completely cool and so hopefully others have benefited from this story as well thank you so much yeah thank you have a great day everybody Bye. thank you for being part of the sustainable clinical medicine podcast if you'd like to learn more or join us to help you get home with today's work done go to chartingcoach.ca There you'll find all the information on the premier lifetime access charting champions program that is helping physicians get home with today's work done with all the proven tools, support and community you need to create time for your life outside of medicine. We would love to see you there until next time. Thanks for listening.